Hello again, and welcome back to Know Your Ship with me, Chase. Today, we'll be looking at the Queen Elizabeth class battleship, which included the famous battleship HMS Warspite. This class of battleship served in both the First and Second World Wars with the Royal Navy. Well, time to sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode. Next in our list of top 10 fighting ships, a battleship class that fought in two world wars was everywhere in every battle and still came through as the winner. Queen Elizabeth class, battleship, displacement, 36,450 tons. Propulsion, quadruple screw steam turbines producing 80,000 horsepower. Speed, 23 knots. Range, 4,500 nautical miles at 10 knots. Protection. Maximum armor, 13 inches. Principal armament, 8 15-inch guns. Crew, 1,190. Launched in 1913, the Queen Elizabeth battleship was the first of a new design of fast battleships that were powered by oil rather than coal. By early 1916, she was joined by her four sister ships, Barham, Malaya, Valiant, and Warspite. Armed with eight 16-inch main guns and 16 6-inch secondary, the Queen Elizabeth class were the most powerful British-class warships in World War I. I think in looking back at the World War I dreadnoughts, by nature of being at the end of that line of development, it represents the zenith of that design, certainly within the Royal Navy. During the 1930s, the ships were modernized. Now with only one smokestack, they were fitted with anti-aircraft capability and their main guns upgraded to fire a 1,900-pound shell over 32,000 yards. The Queen Elizabeths were ready when the Second World War began with Germany. Queen Elizabeth class allowed there to be still ships in the, in the Second World War that, that were, were big, they were slow, but they were big and formidable. They had a fear factor. They kept the Germans in port. As World War II increased in ferocity, it seemed that the Queen Elizabeth class in general, and the war spite in particular, were everywhere. There's a movie made several years ago, Forrest Gump, and he has this way of turning up in every major event. And the war spite seems to have a, a similar knack for turning up at major events. During the Battle of Cape Matapan in the Mediterranean Sea, the war spite made history when she recorded the longest ever hit by a moving gun platform on an enemy warship at 25,000 yards. But the Queen Elizabeth class were not invincible. In November 1941, the Barham became the subject of one of the most famous pieces of combat footage when she was torpedoed by the German U-boat U-331. More than 800 of her crew were killed. In the biggest naval battle of all time, the Battle of Jutland. In the first phase of the battle, with two ships destroyed, Vice Admiral Beatty's battle cruisers were losing the game. What he needed were the tougher battleships of his escort, the 5th Battle Squad. But Beatty had left them trailing too far behind to help. This was not out of character for the man. His instinct was always to run to the guns. The youngest Vice Admiral since Nelson, Vice Admiral Sir David Beatty, was dashing and ambitious. What's more, his battle cruisers had seen most of the naval action so far in the war, hitting the national headlines with their exploits. But here at Jutland, his bravado had cost two battle cruisers and 2,000 lives. And now he was blindly steaming south, towards the jaws of the massed guns of the entire German high seas fleet. But Beatty was about to get his chance to shine. At a little after 4.30, his advanced scouting group spotted smoke over the horizon. Hipper had been leading Beatty's force onto a trap. Instantly, the scouts flashed the signal. Enemy battle fleet sighted. The whole situation changes in an instant. Beatty realises straight away what, the, what the, the peril he's in. But he also, to his credit, realises the opportunity that lies before him. If he can inveigle Shear and the High Seas Fleet to follow him, he can lead them into the arms of Jellicoe and the Grand Fleet. 
At last, Beatty had a chance to turn the tables. Beatty saw the main German fleet uh, and quite correctly he said, right, let's get out of here and turned. Uh, and his job was to lead this lot into the Grand Fleet where the Grand Fleet would destroy it. Soon they were all heading north towards Jellico. All that is except the battleships of the 5th Battle Squadron still trying to catch up. As the battleships pounding southwards passed the battle cruisers, now fleeing northwards, the battleships steamed straight past Beatty, heading straight for the German high seas fleet. For the German commanders, the battleships of the 5th Battle Squadron were a prize beyond their wildest dreams. Admiral Hipper, as well as Admiral Scheer, didn't know that the entire Grand Fleet was at sea. So they are looking for the British battle cruisers, and they saw the uh, fifth battle squadron. Well, maybe this is a chance for us to, to get two or three ships. We have sunk two battle cruisers now, Indefatigable and Queen Mary, in the first phase of the battle. And now let's get part of the Grand Fleet. The British battleships sailed straight into the German guns. In a desperate attempt to head north, they turned in succession through a hail of fire. This is the ultimate test of the Super Dreadnoughts. Those mighty 8, 15-inch guns, 13-inch thick armor. Enormous investments of British money, time and technology with the finest engines that could propel them to nearly 24 knots. Fantastic ships. This was their test. Would they be able to withstand the shells that were falling all round them? Like Indefatigable and Queen Mary, these battleships were also heavily overloaded with shells and cordite. Would they now suffer the same fate? The 5th Battle Squadron took severe damage and many casualties. But for over an hour, the four battleships held off the entire German fleet. There was little wrong with these particular ships. Unlike the battle cruisers, the German shells could not penetrate anywhere important. They caused damage, they caused a lot of damage, they killed people, but they couldn't harm the inner sanctums where the explosive seeds of their own destruction lay. Further north, just before dawn on the 10th of April, Captain Warburton Lee took his second destroyer flotilla, Hardy, Hunter, Havoc, Hotspur and Hostile, into Narvik Field. Snow was falling and surprise was total. Skillfully avoiding collisions with merchant ships, Hardy launched torpedoes at Hyde Camp, which blew off the Germans' stern. Following closely in Hardy's wake, Hunter and Havoc opened fire with guns and torpedoes, finishing off Anton Schmidt and badly damaging Hans Ludemann, while Hostile got two direct hits on Dieter von Rode. Believing that there were only six German destroyers in Narvik and having accounted for four, Warburton Lee brought his ships in for a second attack, this time narrowly avoiding torpedoes fired by the stricken Dieter von Rode. After inflicting more damage and almost out of ammunition and torpedoes, the flotilla raced for the open sea. Unknown to Warburton Lee, the Germans had more destroyers sheltering in side fjords. As his flotilla raced down the field, Wolfgang Zenke, Erich Kulner and Erich Giese emerged from the Herangsfjord and gave chase. And then ahead, coming out of Balgenfjord, were Georg Tyler and Bernd von Annin. In the van of the British line, Hardy faced the combined fire of the German ships alone. Hit again and again, her bridge a bloody shambles in which Warburton Lee lay dying, Hardy turned to the shore and ran aground. The next in line, Havoc, ran the gauntlet, but the third, Hunter, badly hit in the engine room, lost speed. With visibility obscured by smoke, the fourth destroyer, Hotspur, smashed into Hunter's side, pushing her over and leaving her dead in the water. Easy meat for the three pursuing destroyers. Reaching the mouth of the fjord, the surviving British destroyers encountered the German ammunition supply ship Roenfels. Havoc opened fire. Roenfels erupted in an enormous explosion, which sent parts of the ship more than 500 feet skyward. The British returned on the 13th of April with four modern tribal-class destroyers of nearly 2,000 tons. Bedouin, Punjabi, Eskimo and Cossack. And five smaller destroyers, Hero, Forrester, Foxhound, Kimberley and Icarus. They were accompanied by HMS Warspite, a 30,000-ton battleship mounting eight 15-inch guns. Near the entrance of the fjord, one of Warspite's swordfish spotter aircraft, sighting the U-64, sank her with a direct hit by a 100-pound bomb. 
With swordfish aircraft providing aerial reconnaissance, Warspite opened up on Kuna, which disappeared up the field to join Ludemann, Zenka and Arnim. Rounding a bend, Warspite's 15-inch guns now zeroed in on Kölner and blew her apart. The British force, supported by swordfish from the carrier Furious, steadily shepherded the Germans to the head of the field, from which there was no escape. Fighting with desperate gallantry, the German ships managed to inflict damage on three British destroyers, but in the end were all reduced to scrap. It had been just like shelling peas, claimed Captain Crutchley, the commander of Warspite. On the 9th of July 1940, the Italian battle fleet under Admiral Campione and the British Mediterranean fleet under Admiral Andrew Cunningham clashed near Cape Spartivento on the southern coast of Sardinia. Campione's Italian fleet was an impressive force, consisting of two of Italy's modernized fast battleships, Giulio Cesare and Cavour, and 16 cruisers. Its aim was to protect an important convoy of five merchant ships taking supplies to the Italian forces in Libya. The British had broken the Italian naval codes, and Italian intentions were confirmed when RAF reconnaissance aircraft reported that the Italian fleet was at sea. The British Mediterranean fleet, based at Alexandria, sailed to intercept them. It too was intent on protecting two convoys, evacuating civilians and the families of the Malta garrison to Alexandria. True to character, Cunningham was determined to bring the Italians to battle. He steered towards the Italian naval base at Taranto, on Italy's heel, hoping to get between the Italian ships and their principal naval base. The Italians too had broken the British signal codes and knew Cunningham's ships were at sea. The plan was to lure Cunningham's ships in range of land-based Italian bombers, and Campione was under orders to avoid battle until the British fleet came within range of aircraft operating from the Italian mainland. By daylight, Cunningham's fleet of three battleships, surrounded by its protective shield of cruisers and destroyers, were attacked by the Italian Air Force. The fleet included Cunningham's flagship HMS Warspite and the battleships Malaya and Royal Sovereign. His single aircraft carrier, the 20-year-old HMS Eagle, had 17 swordfish torpedo reconnaissance planes and three antiquated Gloucester Gladiator biplanes, which was the fleet's only fighter protection. As the waves of bombers flew overhead, Cunningham's iron-grey warships were engulfed in tall, black towers of water, erupting around them from the carpet of bombs dropped by the Regia Aeronautica. The Italian three-engine bombers, using level bombing runs, dropped mainly 110 and 220-pound bombs that were not powerful enough to have a critical impact even when they occasionally hit the target. The bombers had not practiced ship attack and it showed in their general ineffectiveness. HMS Gloucester alone was hit on its compass bridge, killing its captain and six of its officers. But despite this, the cruiser was able to remain with the fleet. On the morning of the 9th of July, the Italian fleet was located some 145 miles west of Cunningham's force by a Malta-based RAF Sunderland flying boat. By noon, the two fleets were 80 miles apart and the Eagle's swordfish shadowed the Italian fleet. By this time, the Italian Air Force had lost contact. Campione launched a reconnaissance aircraft from his flagship, Giulio Cesare, and found Cunningham's ships. Hoping that the bombing attacks would have reduced Cunningham's strength, Campione pressed on towards the British force, knowing that his two battleships could outrun and outgun those of the enemy. His six heavy and ten light cruisers were superior to Cunningham's four effective light cruisers, especially with the damaged Gloucester being held back from the action to protect the Eagle. At 11.45, a small strike force of five swordfish flew off from the Eagle but failed to score any hits. It was a problem that the British were going to face again and again, as there were simply not enough British aircraft to launch an effective attack. By 3 p.m. on a clear blue Mediterranean day, the enemy fleets came in sight of each other. The Italian heavy cruisers turned their 8-inch guns 
and opened fire at the British cruiser screen at a range of some 13 miles. The British replied with their six-inch guns, but were outmatched by the Italian cruisers until the war spite steamed up and fired her 15-inch guns. The Italians turned away, covered by a smokescreen. It was now the turn of the battleships to come within range. At 3.53 p.m., the war spite opened fire at 26,000 yards with her 15-inch guns at maximum elevation. Campione's two battleships replied in earnest. In a maelstrom of water spouts and smoke, both sides faced one another. It was a classic sea battle. Cunningham was rewarded with the sight of a great orange-coloured flash at the base of the Giulio Cesare funnel. It was a hit that caused fires to break out below decks on Campione's flagship. The Giulio Cesare was damaged, but not fatally, and the Italian fleet turned away under a heavy smokescreen. In the confused action that followed, Cunningham's ships were unable to match the speed of the faster Italian ships and lost contact. It was only now that the bombers of the Italian Air Force appeared. To Campione's fury, they mistook the Italian fleet for that of the Royal Navy and repeatedly bombed his ships as they steamed back towards the Italian mainland. Over the next four days, as they steamed back to port, the British fleet came under intense air bombardment, with 22 attacks and over 300 bombs being dropped on the 12th of July alone, 36 of them plunging within 200 yards of the war spite. The three outnumbered gladiators on the Eagle performed miracles and shot down five of the attacking bombers as they covered the withdrawal of the fleet to Alexandria. In late March 1941, ultra decryptions of Italian naval traffic told Cunningham about an attempt by the Italian fleet to intercept British convoys ferrying luster force to Greece. Cunningham diverted the threatened convoys and ordered a force of four cruisers and nine destroyers to lie in wait while he sailed from Alexandria with his battle squadron and the newly arrived carrier Formidable carrying 24 aircraft including 13 Fulmar fighters and four swordfish torpedo bombers. On the 27th of March, air reconnaissance indicated that the Italian Navy was at sea and heading towards Crete. Admiral Iacchino sailed with three battle groups, one of which included the battleship Vittorio Veneto. His aim was to attack merchant shipping and convoys and, if the situation was entirely favourable, to engage British warships. Cunningham's cruisers made the first contact and came under fire from the Italian battleship's 15-inch guns. Cunningham engaged her with aircraft from the Formidable and harried her with his cruisers, causing the Vittorio Veneto to break contact. A second strike of three Albacores and two Swordfish of number 829 squadron hit the battleship and reduced its speed, killing Lieutenant Commander J. Dalyolstead. RAF bombers from Greece also launched a series of attacks against the Italian fleet without success. This was the first instance of cooperation between the RAF and the British Mediterranean fleet against an enemy fleet at sea. Cunningham ordered a third strike, but the eight aircraft were unable to hit the Vittorio Veneto, being put off by the combination of anti-aircraft fire, searchlight dazzle and smoke. But in the melee that followed, they torpedoed and disabled one of the escorting cruisers, the Pola. Cunningham believed the Vittorio Veneto to be damaged and was determined to accept the risk of a night action in bringing it to battle. At 9.11pm, radar on the Valiant picked up a vessel on its screen that was stationary in the water. The British battleships Warspite, Valiant and Barham closed with the unknown enemy, but instead intercepted two 8-inch gun cruisers, Zara and Fiume, which were coming to the Polar's aid. With the help of searchlights, all three battleships poured broadside after broadside into the surprised cruisers, who, with guns fore and aft, were totally unprepared for a night action. As turrets and other heavy debris whirled through the air and splashed into the sea, before long the ships themselves were on fire from stem to stern. Both ships were sunk, and in searching for the elusive Vittorio Veneto, Cunningham's destroyers came across the disabled Polar, and after taking off her crew, sunk her with torpedoes. The loss of three fast, heavy cruisers, two destroyers and 2,400 officers and men in return for the British loss of one aircraft and its crew was a further blow to Italian pride. In 
In July 1941, the Italian 10th Light Flotilla launched a bold but unsuccessful attack on Valletta Harbour. This was an Italian elite force that specialised in one-man explosive motorboats, or EMB. Frogmen and two-man chariots with an explosive warhead known as slow-speed torpedoes, or PIGs. The latter would travel underwater until reaching the target where the frogman would detach the warhead by clamping it to the keel with a time fuse. The 10th Light Flotilla conducted a number of operations, many of which reached their targets but failed because of defects in the chariot warhead. Despite this, they successfully sank the cruiser York and a merchant ship in Suda Bay on the 26th of March 1941. The raid on Malta on the night of the 25th of July involved a bold foray by a small force comprising the Italian auxiliary warship Diana with eight EMBs and two motor torpedo boats, each towing a two-man chariot. The plan was for one of the chariots to blow away past the obstructions blocking the entrance into the Grand Harbour and then for the remaining chariots and EMBs to enter and attack shipping. The brilliant designer of the craft, Lieutenant Tassai, was assigned to clear the obstacle, but something went wrong and he was never seen again. When this failed, two of the one-man EMBs deliberately sacrificed themselves by blowing their craft up to achieve a gap. Malta's radar had already picked up the remaining craft and as they moved in, all of the EMBs were destroyed. The two MTBs were attacked and sunk by aircraft the following day, but the Diana escaped. Despite Tessai's death, his vision continued. The 10th Flotilla destroyed three merchant ships in Gibraltar Harbour in September 1941. But on the night of the 18th of December, it struck a major blow, when three two-man chariots entered Alexandria Harbour and attached explosive warheads to Cunningham's flagship, the Queen Elizabeth, the Valiant, and to the tanker Sagona. Both warships were badly damaged and settled on the harbour bed while the stern was blown off the Sagona, damaging the destroyer Jervis alongside. Coupled with the losses at sea to German U-boats in November, this bold action by six Italian frogmen, who were captured before they could escape, eliminated the strike power of the Mediterranean fleet. On the 24th of November, U-331, commanded by Lieutenant Commander von Tissenhausen, intercepted the Mediterranean fleet at sea off Sonnum, penetrated the destroyer screen and hit the battleship Barham with three torpedoes. She immediately began to list to port. An enormous explosion followed and the great ship disintegrated with the loss of 868 of her crew. <laughs>